What's happening everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics and today we got a Jethro Tull reaction to the famous Aqualung album. This one's brought to us by a friend, longtime patron and supporter of the channel, Rich. Appreciate you, Rich. And I don't know much about this album. I know it's a classic. I have reacted to two of the songs on here. One of them was a long time ago. The other one wasn't that long ago, so I sort of remember it. That would be my guide. But really, otherwise, don't know anything about Jethro Tull. Maybe they popped up a couple times in the live streams that we do over on Twitch. Check out the link below. Give us a follow there. So dove pretty deep into the research on this one because, hey, man, we're reactions to the classics, and we didn't have this one up. So thanks again, Rich, for bringing it to us. Let's, let's check out the research a little bit. Four studio album released in March of 1971. Number four in the UK, number seven in the U.S., widely regarded as a concept album featuring a central theme of the distinction between religion and God, though the band have said there was no intention to make a concept album, and that only a few songs have a unifying theme. It's their best-selling album, sold over 7 million copies. It was their first album with keyboardist John Evan as a full-time member, their first with new bassist Jeffrey Hammond, and last album featuring Clive Bunker on the drums, who quit the band shortly after the release of the album. Something of a departure from the band's previous work, the album features more acoustic material than previous releases and inspired by photographs of homeless people uh, taken by singer Ian Anderson's then-wife Jenny, contains a number of recurring themes addressing religion along with Anderson's own personal experiences. The songs on the album encompass a variety of musical genres with elements of folk, blues, psychedelia, and hard rock. Back in 2005, an interview included on Aqualung Live, Ian Anderson gives his thoughts on the matter of it being a concept album. This is Ian, I quote, I always said at the time, this is not a concept album. It's just an album of varied songs, of varied instrumentation and intensity, in which three or four are the kind of keynote pieces for the album. But it doesn't make it a concept album. In my mind, when it came to writing the next album, Thick as, as a Brick, it was done very much in the sense of well, if they thought Aqualong was a concept album, oh, okay, we'll show you a concept album. And I know that one's considered a classic as well. And it was done as kind of a spoof, a send-up of the concept album genre. But Aqualong itself, in, in my mind, was never a concept album, just a bunch of songs. The album cover is pretty famous. Its original cover art by Burton Silverman features a watercolor portrait of a long-haired, bearded man in shabby clothes. The idea for the cover came from the photograph Anderson's wife took of the homeless man, and Anderson later felt it would have been better to have used a photograph rather than commission the painting. Ian Anderson recalls posing for a photograph for the painting, but though Silverman claims it was a self-portrait. So, all tracks on this album are written by Ian Anderson, unless I note otherwise. Let's kick this classic off. And before I get into the first track, which of course you see below the self-titled Aqua Lung, just a reminder, the music will not be in the video, but... Click on the Vimeo link below. You can watch along with me. This is one of those songs that wasn't written just by Ian. It was written with his then wife, Jenny. The lyrics convey a story of a homeless man named Aqualung. The lyrics compare the tramp's unhealthy breathing to a, quote, deep sea diver sounds referring to the actual Aqualung device. And Ian gave an interview in September of 1999 to Guitar World. He said, Aqualung wasn't a concept album, although a lot of people thought so. The idea came about from a photograph my wife took at the time of a tramp in London. I had feelings of guilt about the homeless, as well as fear and insecurity with people like that who seem a little scary. And I suppose all of that was combined with a slightly romanticized picture of the person who is homeless, but yet a free spirit who either won't or can't join in society's prescribed formats. So from the photograph and those sentiments, I began writing the words to Aqualung. I can remember sitting in a hotel in LA working out the chord structure for the verses. It's quite a tortured tangle of chords, but it was meant to really drag you here and there and then set you down into the more gentle acoustic section of the song. This character is also mentioned in the next track, by the way, Cross-Eyed Mary, and it was not released as a single. Ian explained the reason why to Song Facts. He said because it was too long, it was too episodic. It starts off with a loud guitar riff and then goes into a rather more laid back acoustic stuff. Led Zeppelin at the time, you know, they didn't release any singles. It was album tracks and radio sharply divided between AM radio, which played the three minute pop hits, and FM radio, where they played what they called deep cuts. You would go into an album and play the obscure, the longer, the more convoluted songs in that period of more developmental rock music. But that day's really not with us anymore. He said this in 1999. It's definitely not with us 
now. And just another little bit of trivia that I've come across in the research that I didn't have in my notes, but since I mentioned Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin was actually recording Led Zepp 4 in the same studio. There was only two studios in, in the studio that they were working. Led Zepp was recording Led Zepp 4 in one studio and then Toll was recording Aqualung in the other. I just thought that was pretty cool. Two classic albums recorded in the same studios at the same time. All right, I'll have the lyrics up as always. Let's dive into this. Aqualung or Aqualung as my man Ian says it with his accent. I'll tell you what, man, I, I almost wanted to stop that. You guys know me, I never stop a song during a reaction because I want the song to play all the way through, but there's so much going on in this song, like so many tempo changes, so much stuff that I, I'm like, golly, am I gonna remember all this? But it starts with the hook, right? So he just describes this guy, you know, kind of how he is. He's got greasy fingers, smearing shabby clothes. Hey, aqua lungs drying in the cold sun, feeling like a dead duck, spitting out pieces of his broken luck. And then you get in the chorus, leg hurting bad as he bends to pick a dog end. I had to research a dog end as a cigarette butt where it hasn't been smoked all the way. It's just a little bit of tobacco, just showing how he's down on his luck. But but we go from, you know, driving instrumentation. And then when you get into early on in it, I think it was in that first chorus there that I just talked about where all of a sudden he has this far away treatment on his voice. It sounds like AM radio. Ian talked about AM radio and FM radio and the quote I gave before this song started. So it almost sounds like AM radio and then he brings it back and then he dials it way back and it's got this nice music and then the drums come in. The guitar solo is great. And then we get into the bridge and the hook. Just a fantastic song. I mean, the instrumentation on it's obviously fantastic. You got Martin Barr on electric guitar. The drums with Clive were fantastic. And I don't have individual instrumentation credits on any of these and because ian plays so much stuff heck who knows what he was playing but a fantastic way to start and if you put this album on when it came out in 1971 you know you were in for something right after listening to this song a perfect opener now as you see we're going to go to cross-eyed mary the song is about cross-eyed mary a schoolgirl prostitute who prefers the company of Letching Grays over her schoolmates. It was intended as a companion piece to Aqualong that we just heard um, the opening track about a homeless man. The Aqualong character is given a cameo in Cross-Eyed Mary. And Ian said about the song, it's a song about another form of low life, but more humorous. It's about a schoolgirl prostitute, but not in such coarse terms. She goes with dirty old men because she's doing them a favor, giving people what they want because it makes them happy. It's a fun kind of song, Ian said in 1971. All right, let's check it out. All right, Cross-Eyed Mary. Had about a minute of instrumental build before the song even started. Ian was really coming in with the flute on this at the beginning, at the end, as you just heard, and also as a solo in the beginning, or in the middle, I mean, and then Martin had his guitar. So when the guitar work was fantastic, the, the keyboard work by John Evan was great, and Clive was really banging it on the drums, a propulsive tune. As far as this being kind of a fun tune, as far as lyrically, as Ian said, I don't know about that, man, but it's very well written. That's I'm very impressed on these first two songs, not just by the musicianship, which I expected to be, but by the songwriting by Ian. But, you know, it does tell the story of this teenage prostitute, uh, and it just starts out, and, and who would steal the candy from a laughing baby's mouth if he could take it from the money man. And then you get the whole, he delivers the chorus in kind of a different vocal style, but Cross-Eyed Mary goes jumping in again. She signs no contract, but she always plays the game, the game of prostitution. She dines in Hampstead Village, which I read is a rich part uh, in the UK, on expense accounted gruel. So these guys taking her there uh, that have employed her services are writing it off as a business expense. And the jackknife barber, which is supposedly about someone who performed an abortion, drops her off at school. So. She does all this stuff, leads this other life. Now she's at school and then she's laughing in the playground, gets no kicks from the little boys. We'd rather make it with a leching gray or maybe her attention is drawn by Aqualung. So there's the shout out to Aqualung who watches through the railings as they play. So obviously her and her client are doing something and Aqualung is, is spying on it. So just some really, really good songwriting here and just a, a very, very well done song arrangement wise, musicianship wise. Now we'll go on to the third track. Very short, it's only a minute 20. Cheap Day Return, written by Ian after returning to London from the north where he had visited his father in the hospital. He sadly wonders whether the nurses are treating his father as well as they should and whether they're just being nice to him because he's famous. Well, there you have it, Cheap Day Return. Not a lot to the song. It's really just a fragment of a song that they included in here, which it's always interesting when artists do it. I really liked it. The acoustic by Ian is very nice. And his voice sounds much softer and more refined 
than on the first two songs. And I mean, it just says on press and platform, do your soft shoe shuffle dance, brush away the cigarette ash that's falling down your pants. And then you sadly wonder, does the nurse treat your old man the way she should? She made you tea, asked for your autograph. What a laugh. So like I said, the acoustic was nice on there. His voice was nice on there. Now we move on to the fourth track, Mother Goose. The lyrics are of surreal figures based on images that Ian wrote with the same abstract ideas as Cross-Eyed Mary. Uh-oh, what are we gonna have here? Mother Goose, just what I said, it's a surrealistic type of uh, of look as this, as this kid's walking through. He's a schoolboy, they tell us, as he's going through the Piccadilly Circus and all the people he encounters. But I thought it was the best job so far, just instrumentally, of really blending that flute with the rest of the instruments, just the driving, dun, dun, dun. I, I really, really enjoyed it from a musicianship standpoint. Almost the most catchy song on here is I still have that riff going through my head. And that's one of the things four songs in, you realize that they can just go in so many different directions, yet it all sounds good. Just one verse in here, just to give you an idea of the surrealistic uh, lyrics. Saw Johnny Scarecrow make his rounds in his jet black Mac which he won't give back. Stole it from a snowman as I did walk by Hampstead Fair. I came upon Mother Goose, so I turned her loose. She was screaming. So a, a really fun song there. Go to another short track, Wondering Aloud. It talks about a day in the life of a loving couple, though it's been interpreted to be about something less uh, appropriate. There exists a longer version of the song called Wondering Again. It was originally meant for the album, but was cut and replaced by the shorter one. The longer song, which has entirely different lyrics, was included in the compilation album Living in the Past, so if you want to go look for that. Later in 2011, an even longer version that combines both tracks, Wondering Aloud Again, was released as one of the bonus tracks for the 40th anniversary edition of this one. Bassist Glenn Cornick has said that it is his favorite song recorded with the band. It's only a minute 53, so quite the buildup. Like the other short turn cheat day return, I think Ian's voice is more refined here. I really enjoyed that, man. Just the, the arrangement of it, it's it's so much softer. And, and I guess just the whole song itself more refined, not in a bad way, meaning that the other songs aren't refined. The other songs are absolutely fantastic, but just a different little style here. Almost a, a, a part of a song too, but we do get two verses out of this and the little outro I like, and it's only the giving that makes you what you are so it starts out wondering aloud how we feel today last night sipped the sunset my hand in her hair we are our own saviors as we both as we start both our hearts beating life into each other so um yeah i really did enjoy that one too uh, the the arrangement on this album so far is fantastic in the way we kind of progress dial back progress now we're gonna go up to the last song on the a side we have up to me up to me you know as we're through the first side here, I gotta tell you, the flute just adds something to this in such an interesting way, just to their music, Ian's so fantastic on that. And you know, the drumming with Clive here, a nice little riff in here again, just telling the story of this guy, that, you know, it's up to him kind of what he does, take you to the cinema and leave you in a wimpy bar. You tell me we've gone too far, come running up to me. Then they're gonna go to make the scene at Cousin Jack's, leave him to put the bottles back, mint his glasses that I cracked. Well, that one's up to me. Hey, whoa, it's up to me. And then buy a silver cloud to ride. I, I read that's a Rolls Royce. So now he's into the rich world. Pack the tennis club inside. Trouser cuffs hung far too wide. Well, it's up to me. And he just kind of keeps going through there. The bridge. Well, I'm a common man with a half of bitter bread and jam. And if it pleases me, I'll put one on you, man. When the copper fades away, he'll, he'll hit this guy once the cop's out of sight. Whoa, it's up to me. Ow, whoa, you said it's up to me. So... A fun song there, a really good way to finish out the side. And remember, I mention this all the time with you older stuff. It's 1971. How you start and finish a side of vinyl is so vitally important because you want them to flip it over and go to side two, which is exactly what we're going to do as we go to My God. This is a song that in the last few months I've done a reaction to, but I did a reaction to a live performance. And the thing is, when you're reacting to stuff, the live performance, you know, you can't focus on the lyrics like you'd like to because you're taking in so much other stuff. That's why I love doing live performances. I, I still prefer to do it this way most of the time because I can look at the lyrics and I can really sink into the music. This one was written by Ian. It's a song about how mankind, especially the churches, has often bent the meaning of religion to better suit their selfish wants and needs. Ian says about this song, my God isn't a song against God or against the idea of God, but it's against God and the hypocritical church of the establishment. 
it's a criticism of the God they choose to worship. So full disclosure, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a devout Christian, but uh, the way churches are, and especially here, the Western churches in America, I definitely am not on board with that and have uh, spoke out against that several times as we chase wealth and all these things that are not taught to us in the Bible. So look forward to diving into this one. There you have it, my God. Along with Aqua Along, by far the most prog rock type of song. I think this one really, really um, pushes into that genre and does it quite a bit of justice. You can feel almost the contempt in Ian's voice as he delivers these lines. The flute is spot on, but then the guitar riff by Martin to emphasize certain things that he says is tremendous. And of course, the drumming by Clive and John on the keys and then Jeffrey uh, on his bass, also just fantastic. So on the instrumentation part, it's great. On the on the song itself, very, very uh, well written and, and written in a way that's, that's interesting as well because he writes verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. So it shows you the diversity and talent that Ian really has in songwriting. Uh, people, what have you done? Locked him in his golden cage, golden cage. Made him bend to your religion. Him resurrected from the grave, from the grave. So taking what the Bible says and what Jesus came to this earth to do and twisting it around for your own benefit. And uh, verse 2, see, lean upon him gently and don't call on him to save you from your social graces and the sins you used to wave. Chorus 2, in the bloody church of England, in chains of history, request your earthly presence. So an, an interesting little uh, shout out. And you could feel the, the passion in his voice when he, when he delivered that. Verse 3, in the graven image, you know who with this plastic crucifix. He's got him fixed. Confuses me as to who and where and why. As to how he gets his kicks, he gets his kicks. And then the outro comes in after the last course with a solo guitar and a solo flute against it. Just a seven plus minute epic song arranged so well, written so well, played so well. Um, it's a highlight musicianship wise for me on this album along with Aqua Lung. We're gonna keep on with the religious theme. Notice I didn't say concept, right? With him, 43. This was released as a single, went to 91 in the US. Their first song to chart here in the US. Ian described the song as, quote, a blues for Jesus about the gory, glory seekers who use his name as an excuse for a lot of unsavory things. You know, hey, Dad, it's not my fault. The missionaries lie. In hymns ancient and modern, which was common use in common use in the Church of England when Ian was growing up, hymn 43 is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So I'm sure lyrically, I'm going to have some stuff to comment on this one. Let's check it out. Hymn 43. Interesting that it starts right away with Ian singing. There's no instrumental breakup, but the instrumentation on this is fantastic. Martin's guitar work, Clive's drumming, and John's keyboard on here just fantastic that riff dun 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 dun, dun and the the lyrics are fire um if ian felt this way 50 years ago at the time that i record this about the church being corrupted oh my goodness what he must think now uh oh father high in heaven smile down upon your son hey hey who's busy with his money games oh his women and his gun oh jesus save me the church leaders who so many are so corrupt uh and the unsung Western hero, so he kind of goes into this little Hollywood thing. Bridge, if Jesus saves, well, he better save himself from the gory, gory seekers who use his name in death. Oh, just a fantastically powerful bridge. We go into a guitar solo, gets back to that bridge. And then one more verse. So lyrically, there's not a ton of lyrics, but the lyrics are very well done. They pack a punch in a short amount of time. And then the musicianship on this thing, it's just a jam. So really enjoyed that. It's a rock jam on this one. Now we're gonna go to another short track on here, just a little bit over a minute long, Slipstream. Slipstream, another fragment, kind of like Wondering Aloud and Cheap Day Return. And a very smart way to put this in here after the intensity of the previous two tunes, both, two tunes, both lyrically and instrumentally. This is really just a folk tune, just a nice little thing. Ian sounds great in it until the last like 15 seconds of it. And then it gives you this sense of uneasiness. So I like the way they kind of switch it up there. And and like I said, these fragments of songs being in here, they're quite interesting. Uh, I wonder in concert, man, play these as a, as a medley. They would sound great. But Ian's voice, once again, sounds great on this. Now we go to the other song on here that I knew because we did a song reaction to it. I don't really remember it locomotive breath it was written as a comment on population growth it was meant to replicate the chugging rhythm of a train 
Lyrically, is inspired by Ian's concern regarding overpopulation. He explained it this way. He said, it was my first song that was perhaps on a topic that would be a little more appropriate to today's world. It was about the runaway train of population growth and capitalism. It was based on the sorts of unstoppable ideas. We're on this crazy train. We can't get off it. Where's it going? Bearing in mind, of course, when I was born in 1947, the population of Earth was slightly less than a third of what it is today. So it should be a sobering thought that in one man's lifetime, our planetary population has more than tripled. It's insane. You'd think population growth would have brought prosperity, happiness, food, and a reasonable spread of wealth. But quite the opposite has happened, and is happening even more to this day. Without putting it into too much literal detail, that was what lay behind the song. And it was recorded in an unusual manner for the time. It was pieced together from overdubs, as most of the parts of the song were recorded separately. Ian did his normal flute and vocal parts in addition to the bass drum, hi-hat, acoustic guitar, and some electric guitar parts. This man is a savant, man. John Evans' piano parts were then recorded. Clive added the rest of the drums, and Martin Barr finished the electric guitar parts. All of these recordings were then overdubbed onto each other because Ian was finding it difficult to communicate his musical ideas about the song to the other band members. So he had it in his head, everybody want to do this separate, and I'll put it together, and it'll end up like he wants it. Let's check it out. Locomotive Breath... Kind of like aqua long, different songs within a song, right? Because it starts out, John does that nice bluesy piano for almost like the first minute, a long instrumental build in here, and then some other instruments start to come in. But then we get in a much more up-tempo uh, driving song. And, you know, it starts off in the shuffling madness of the locomotive breath, runs the all-time loser headlong to his death. He feels the piston scraping, steam breaking on his brow. Old Charlie stole the handle and the train it won't stop going. No way to slow down. He sees his children off at the stations one by one. His woman and his best friend in bed and having fun. He's crawling down the corridor on his hands and knees. So just a really well put together song. The flute solo in the middle is fantastic. Once you understand that all this stuff was recorded separately and then basically Ian set it all on top of each other exactly like he wanted it. It kind of lends to the uh, beauty and almost masterpiece that this song is really enjoy that one now we go to wind up i couldn't find a lot about this song someone says the title is a pun it refers to the fact it's the last song on the album and therefore winding up the album and also the fact that it will wind up the representatives of the mainstream churches in the sense of getting them upset so let's dig into the lyrics and see what we think wind up another diverse song instrumental i thought martin's guitar on this was fantastic when I mean, everybody's firing all cylinders but man his guitar was fantastic. This is the one with the most to probably break down lyrically, although everything I read about it lyrically, it's not anything Ian said. So I don't really want to get into too much of that speculation by people. I did read what Ian kind of believes about God, and you know he believes God is all around us and doesn't really uh, kind of come into our lives and really interfere with our lives. And he lets us lead our lives, and everything around us is a proof of kind of God is in everything. I don't believe that as a Christian at all, but we can have... We can have different beliefs. I'm not really going to break down everything in the song lyrically, but asked this God a question. And by way of firm reply, he said, I'm not the kind you have to wind up on Sundays. So then he kind of tells everyone, I don't believe, he tells the church people and his, his family that he doesn't really believe what they're telling about all these things you have to do for God. Because once again, I think the bigger picture is he's seen how churches manipulate God's word and saying this is for God to suit their own needs and that definitely goes on today and that is not the god of the bible and that's not why jesus came here to die so end of religion talk but it has to be talked about on this song but a fantastic song and a great way to end this album and now we're gonna get to my favorite tracks honorable mention i like the three shorter tunes i thought they were fantastic they're not going to come in as honorable mentions because they're really not proper songs so to speak but ian sounds great enjoy those being put in there honorable mentions cross-eyed mary and up to me my favorites many of them are going to be cliched because they're the most famous songs in the album but they're that way for a reason we got aqua lung we got my god we got locomotive breath and you know what i'm going to throw mother goose in there as well i just thought it was a fun song and done so well instrumentally now we get to my overall score of the album obviously jethro toll was put in the prog rock category if you watch this channel a lot you know that i'm hit and miss on prog rock at best but i don't really consider this prog rock there's elements in it and the best elements of it are in here but it's all kinds of different genres combined into this album and it's only 43 minutes long i think that's where some prog rock goes kind of off base a little bit on these 
you know, hour and 15, hour and 30 minute long albums and these 15 minute songs. Some of them are great, but too much of that is just, well, too much of that. So enjoyed all the varying things on here. So with that said, I'm going to be at an 8.5 on this album, a sky high rating for a first reaction. I can see why it's considered a masterpiece. Although at the time when this album came out, critics were very mixed on it. So it shows you how a little time and a little history can really put a shine on an album that people sometimes don't know what they think of. But I quite enjoyed this album. I thought the musicianship was top notch. I like the different vocal deliveries from Ian, right? Sometimes he can sound a little rough, not in a bad way when the song needs it, but then he can dial that back. Sounds super refined. So, and songwriting, man, Ian's songwriting is, uh, is way up there, man, way up there. And that's something I never hear with, uh, with Toll, but got to recognize that songwriting, man, quite diverse. So guys, Thank you for joining me, Rich. Thank you for bringing this one. Thank you to all the patrons and supporters. If you'd like to help us in any way, check out the Patreon link below or the link in the end screen that's about to hit, guys. Until next time, I will see ya.